Surviving Veterinary Medicine. Be smart, be bold, be creative, and be your own boss. At the very least, find a practice where you can do what you do in the most positive way that gives you the space to practice medicine as you see fit. Because at SVM, we set a higher standard for medicine than what you learned in school. I'm your host, Dr. Narda Robinson, veterinarian, osteopathic physician, and leader of the Vet Med Revolution, calling for safer, gentler, and more effective medicine for animals and their people. Welcome to this month's episode. Today we'll be talking about living on the edge in exotic and wild animal medicine. In Vet Med, we still need to learn much more about species across the board. But when you practice on the edge and work with wild or exotic species, the depth of information really thins out. And that's why it requires such a hefty degree of intellectual curiosity, grit, and compassion, as exhibited by my three guests today, Dr. Lisa Wolf, Dr. JoLynn Chapel, and CuraCore's own Nancy Howard. I first met Dr. Lisa Wolf, a veterinarian with the State of Colorado Division of Wildlife, while working with the Greenwood Wildlife Sanctuary in Boulder, Colorado. Shortly after my graduation from CSU Vet School, where I'd also begun the veterinary acupuncture service, I met Dr. JoLynn Chapel. She saw exotic species in her private practice in Loveland, Colorado. And also around that time, I met Nancy Howard. She worked with Dr. Wolf for DOW and eventually became their district wildlife manager. She brought her black cat to see me for acupuncture, and soon thereafter, she began making movies for me about the patients I was seeing at CSU. And now I'm happy to say that she's our media guru at CuraCore and produces professional videos and other media for us. These are my colleagues and also my friends. Working with wildlife was what brought me to veterinary medicine. Working with women like these has made it incredible. Hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Wolf. I worked for 18 years for Colorado Parks and Wildlife as the field veterinarian. As a field veterinarian, we do herd health. Uh, we work with the researchers, biologists, um, officers, do all the training for capture mobilization, um, look at herd health and figure out what testing needs to be done and see if any management can be done, that kind of thing. Uh, we uh, at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we also have a research center. So I was the attending veterinarian for all of the animals at the research center as well. Um, prior to that, I worked for Joe Lynn. And how was that? It was great. But, you know, uh, some of the things you were talking about as as far as surviving medicine, um, the medicine was fascinating and I loved working with the the wild animals there. One of the things about surviving, I think, is also learning your personality. And I am not as much of a people person as JoLynn. Like she was much better with the clients and education and handholding and that kind of thing, which is a really important part of practice. I'm more of a scientist, just jump in there and get stuff done. So it was, um, you didn't feel like you were in the right spot after right. a while? Yeah. Yeah. I I love working with animals. And I, not that I don't love people. I do love working with people, but I'm not as, I don't have the personality that exudes some of the uh, handholding that people that come into a practice with a sick animal mm-hmm. honestly need. I just want to get the case taken care of and there's more to it than that. So so how did you find your way to the Division of Wildlife? Well, my husband had to be the head wildlife veterinarian. So I, I was already doing the medicine for him. He didn't like he, he's much, he's a veterinarian as well, obviously, but he's more of an epidemiologist scientist and wasn't as interested in the medicine or that hands-on medicine, doing the surgery, that kind of thing as I was. So I was already doing a lot of that. Um, and then a clinical position opened up with the Division of Wildlife, which was new to have a, another veterinarian. Um, actually, prior to that, I, Uh, One of the researchers at CSU needed a field veterinarian for her project. She needed someone to go out and dart and handle uh, deer for her project. And so I applied for that position and got it and spent two years in the field doing her field capture for her. 
And at that time, we also developed a, a technique that had been used in domestic sheep for testing for chronic wasting disease. Mm. So because we were able to develop a live test uh, as part of her project for chronic wasting disease, when the clinical physician came up with a division of wildlife that was specifically as a diagnostician for clinical chronic wasting disease, you know, I had all of the boxes checked. So I was able to get the position. That's really great. That's really great. Thank you. And and then Jolyn, um, what was it like for you to evolve from where you started out and then along the way? Well, I, I graduated from CSU in 91 and was hired at a um, private clinic. And I was hired specifically to do their, uh, to start up their avian and exotic program. They didn't have anything at all. And so I was there for probably about a year and a half, almost two years. And then um, I had the opportunity to spread out and go out on my own. Uh, Because with exotic medicine, unless the practice is really geared to do it, um, it's a bit of a struggle and you're expected to, to do everything. (laughs) And I thought, well, might as well do this on my own. (laughs) Yeah. But, uh, and that way I could do it the way I wanted to do it. And so, um, it, so it evolved where I, I became the owner of, um, Aspen wing and, uh, had that for about 27 years until I recently retired about a year and a half ago. But um, it was it was quite a learning process. I don't know that um, it, maybe it wasn't the smartest move, but because I didn't have anyone else, I was in there by myself. Mm-hmm. I was a sole practitioner, but I'm finding I maybe as I get older or maybe back then too, I work better by myself sometimes anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because I can, I can, uh, I don't have to answer to anybody, <laughs> right. but um, the few times when I had uh, other people helping, like when Lisa was there, I've had a few associates, um, it, it made it um, way fun, actually. <laughs> me, me and Lisa had a ball um, kind of uh, fumbling our way through some of the surgeries, because back then, a lot of times there was species we were working on that didn't even have... Um, uh, anatomy books or anything on it. So we were kind of like, Hmm, I wonder what this is. <laughs> so I think the reason I uh, went into, I mean, that's the reason I went into vet school is to work on birds, birds more, mostly that parrots are my passion. And, um, it, it was, it's such a new field still even now, but back then it was a super young field and it was, um, it was exciting. It was really cool. And, you know, looking at how I did things way back then is totally different than how I did it now. And it's, it's all about learning, like you, like you had mentioned before, is trying to make it as um, least stressful as possible for the animals, as well as the owner. And there are ways you can do it. You know, you don't just have to go in and grab them by a towel and everything. So it's not just learning all the um, medicine and surgery techniques. It's learning how to handle the animals and how to communicate to the owner so that they will um, learn how to maybe manage the animals better uh, because probably at least 95% of the problems that came in were husbandry and diet related problems. But people were like, most people were like sponges. They will, you know, if you give them, information on how to change it. And that was, that was cool. You know, so I found that if I was helping the animal and helping the owner help that animal themselves, it was very rewarding, you know, extremely rewarding to do that. And uh, I can't imagine just working in a dog and cat practice. I just, it's, you know, at any one point in time, we'd have five or six different species walk through the door. And then up front, it was like a party because everybody was fascinated with what, oh, what did you bring in? Or half the time they all knew each other and it was coffee time for everyone. So um, yeah, it it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. 
Yeah. And, and that you knew it during vet school, you had, I think an interesting course of training, like how you pursued the educational stuff post-grad or even during school. During school. Well, you know, and I was, um, I did breed parrots um, and that was my main goal of why I wanted to go to school because there was uh, maybe one person in the state of Colorado that worked on birds. And so at the time I was a veterinary technician, a certified vet tech, and I thought, well, what the heck? <laughs> What's another seven more years? <laughs> um, so I, uh, um, yeah, I, and we happened to move up to uh, Fort Collins. So we, um, uh, yeah, I went to vet school. And at the time I was known as the bird lady because I would bring my baby birds that I was having to hand feed in this porta brooder that my husband made for me. And so I'd have to, you know, in between classes, I'd run into the bathroom and hand feed my birds. And I ended up um, doing a lot of teaching for the students, my co- uh, co-students in, um, in the pre-vet club and stuff. I would do a lot of talks for them, husbandry talks and uh, handling and everything like that. So, and then during the vet school back then, there was very, you probably could count on one hand how many residential and internship uh, programs there were. So I had to, I used every bit of my um, vacation time and my elective time finding other vets that were willing to put up with me. Mm-hmm. And, their wing. and they were, they were invaluable. People were so, um, so willing to get on the phone with you and like, when I'm panicked, like, I have to do a spay on a cockatoo tomorrow. What do I do? (laughs) Dr. Harris would like, you can do this, you know? (laughs) So, you know, you book learn it, but then I didn't have anyone there to hand, hold my hand. So there was, there was challenges, but I wouldn't do it any different. That's what helped me. So, because there's also so many challenges when you're dealing with, with the public and with employees and everything. And, uh, that's what got me through that passion. I had a very, very strong passion for working with the exotics and trying to help them as much as I can. And I got to the point where everyone was calling me the bird whisperer because there's ways you can, you know, people come in and say, oh my God, they'll never, that parrot, you know, great big hyacinth or great big Amazon or something won't step on anybody but their mom. And they come right up to me. You know, it's all your energy, I think, that you bring bring to the room with you and it it calms everyone down too so that was always fun and lisa when did you first meet so i can't remember how long ago but nancy was the officer for our district so um, we've been out on deer capture quite a bit um as well as going fishing and camping and hiking um yeah so i got to know her because she worked was the officer for our district. Right. I can right. tell you when I first met Dr. Lisa Wolf. Oh, okay. Uh, Let's I hear it from remember you. Very clearly. Oh, no. <laughs> we were doing a bighorn sheep capture in Georgetown. Oh, no. It wasn't the one where that ram had a broken leg. The first time I ever met Lisa, she was doing CPR on a bighorn sheep. And I was like, darn, look at that woman. <laughs> She's doing CPR on a sheep. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, that's one of those where your failures are such teaching experiences. Because like in that case, um, th- this ram, I had a, oh, we were going to amputate the leg, I think. It had an open fracture of the leg. And we were doing big orange sheep capture. And it was really early in my career. So didn't have as much experience. And I, and mostly when you're working with the division and NC will understand this, um, you don't have a say in how things are done. I mean, there's a way things are done and trying to get that to change is really difficult. And so anyway, they did these drop net captures with sheep and uh, it can take a little while to process all the sheep. So they were holding this ram off on the side. And as you can imagine, this animal was pretty stressed being held. And it was being held because we were going to do this procedure before we left it. Anyway, the animal finally 
stressed and succumbed and died. And uh, interestingly, we even stopped for lunch on our way down there for the canyon. And these people came up to my table and they said, you're the vet that let that ram die. And that was just crushing to me. And yet such a learning experience because understanding stress kind of developed my career. Um, And like you can, there's a couple of awards up here for the drug protocols that we developed to alleviate stress in handling animals. Because that kind of experience, you know, it, it cuts to your core. It's like, how could I have let that happen? And so at the time, I don't think there's, other than telling them that we can't handle this animal, I, don't, there, I didn't have the tools at the time to manage it. So I spent my career developing the tools to manage situations like that. So. Yeah. And then, um, and then with Nancy's help too, I mean, just seeing you work with the lions, um, mischief and rascal and spunky. Yeah. Rascal and spunky. And, and so, um, so probably the stress control and everything, I mean, that was already in the works. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have had a beautiful place for them. Just like, uh, working at Jill Denton's and a lot of what we dealt with were birds that Again, we're stressed and we're trying to manage feather picking, which is are some of the cases that we brought you. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And um, managing, you know, it's one thing to deal with the medical problem and the immediate problem, like the feather picking, getting the wound to heal up. But then you have to manage the big picture. How did that animal get to that point? And that's a challenge. Right. And, and so many of those issues are um, owner related. You know, it's almost like they over love them. You know, the, the birds, the parrots are still wild animals and they're not meant to be in bed sleeping with you, <laughs> you know. And, and so um, finding tactful ways to deal with, uh, with the owners and in a nice way, I always tried to make it uh, I don't want to put guilt on them. I just want them to change their ways, you know, and that was a, a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, with, with all these exotics and everything that, that, like you say, I mean, they are wild animals. I mean, there's the bigger picture of one could ask why, why is this happening? I mean, there's the, there's the, just their habitat devastation. And so, so we can protect some of them, but just there's a lot of questions, I guess, about who who should have what animals when and and how do you even protect the animals from certain people. So mm-hmm. I so I would think that's a big challenge. That it would be a big challenge for me in terms of surviving that type of practice is just the aggravation from the humans. I mean, everywhere you turn, sort of. But there were, you know, I finally, after maybe 10 years of continual education and everything like that, you, you get a, a large population of your clientele that are educated and it's just a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so-and-so coming in. So, you know, and even if we're dealing with a chronic feather picking situation, they're doing everything they can. And some of these birds are just not going to change, but at least they're not mutilating themselves. And, and I think feather picking, that was a good point you brought up, Lisa, is Chronic feather picking is probably one of the most frustrating things um, anybody can deal with, and but they even do it in the in the wild too. So there's just a a factor there we don't totally understand, um, and I think a lot of the disease processes as well. Mm-hmm. Just like humans, I think COVID's bringing out that that yeah. there's diseases coming up just from all the stress everybody's under right now. Yeah. Right, right. And I think in the exotic practice, I mean, nutrition and husbandry go hand in hand, but especially in the birds, nutrition, and again, this goes back to the COVID in humans, where if you have any underlying disease, it doesn't take much to tip that scale. And right. probably nutrition is one of the bigger ones in birds. And I guess just physical exercise, because if birds are in cages, they're not flying. And learning how to manage that in a domestic situation or a captive situation. Um, again, you can treat the injury or you can treat medically withdrawn, but 
you also have to treat the big picture. Right. Well, and you should explain, Lisa, your, you know, Narda brought up the mountain lions. Um, explain maybe where they come from and why you had them. But also, the, um, and they're doing it with all the zoos now, too. The enrichment, the clicker training and all of that, um, I think, is a huge thing for all these captive animals. So uh, by the time we got our lions, I had been with the division long enough that I could have a little more say on how things were done. So when they asked us to do this study, I said, we can bring lions in and do the study, but not without enrichment. Because when you look at historically problems in captive lions, they're just bored. I mean, you know, they're designed to go out and hunt and explore territory. And then you put them in a captive situation. You've got to find other ways for them to use those same skills. And so fortunately for us, uh, they said, go for it. And so we were actually able, once the lions came in for the study, we were able to go down to Ocean Journey and learn operant conditioning from the trainers with the tigers down there. And then we were also able to go to the um, zoo down in Denver. And we got to work with the African wild dogs and a few things like that to learn how, because it's one thing to train dogs or train birds, but uh, when you can't always be in direct contact with an animal, fortunately, our lions were hand raised so we could handle them. But we were thinking in the long term, we might not always want to be in the cage to do the training. So learning from these trainers. And it's then you start realizing it's that operant conditioning is helping these animals to engage with their environment, with the people. And that's a two way thing. It allows you to know how that patient is doing. If you have a scared animal hiding in the corner, you don't know what its health status is by looking at it. But if you have an animal that typically comes right up to you in the cage and their behavior changes, you know something's wrong. So it became a huge diagnostic tool. It became a mental stimulation. And because they got to be well known because of this, the operant conditioning we did in them, they got to do several different really productive studies and lived along what I consider, you know, in a captive situation, along pretty happy life because they, they did have a lot of stimulation and a lot of, um, at least from a human perspective, they, they did well, right. Totally. Had you had the, the cubs already before they asked you to do this study? Yeah, uh, they had the uh, idea for the study before we got the cubs. And so we had the chance to kind of, decide how we would set it up um, and and that was another part of the learning process just in research in general is it's really easy to be told by researchers you're going to be doing this study um, but as time goes on getting the opportunity to say okay let's sit down and discuss logistics reducing stress good methods of sampling good methods of observation um, that evolved with time as well yeah yeah, and, and just as you're describing that, and, and for you, Joe Lynn, too, um, the care and and um, just forethought and compassion and, and attention to the environment, I mean, all those things for these very sensitive creatures, that applies to humans, but I think humans have been so numbed yeah. that um, that you can go way down the line and, and still be just maladapted uh, to everything, but you can still be alive, but it's the birds like the canary and the coal mine in a way, but, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're going to be the sensitive harbingers and then cats too, and just wildlife in general. So do you think that um, because of your own sensitive nature, you are able to better uh, resonate or better understand the creatures you were working with? I think so. I mean, I, I, because I have been, had been actually raising these birds for at least 10 years um, before I actually got into vet school. I'm aging myself here. But um, it just, and it didn't, you know, I used to do it just the way they said, well, you just have to do it this way. Like when you, when I first started, um, we would just go in and grab the bird with a towel out of the carrier. And a lot of times, you know, even then I would try to talk to the bird and they, I could usually calm them down. But then as time went by and I found 
other ways and other methods. It just feels so much better um, to do it on their terms, you know, and, and that's, you've got to understand they're, they're shoved in a carrier unless they're handled a lot and they're used to a lot of different situations. And we did get some birds like that. Um, most of them were terrified, just terrified. But if you just wait, you just give them, you know, either wait in the carrier, excuse me, um, or get them out on a perch and just start, you don't even have to always talk to them. Just let them kind of look around and get their surroundings. And then um, I think if you had a good energy, and I always tried to have a really calm energy around them, people that will walk in and they were terrified of the bird, they're not going to get anywhere near these birds. But if you would just be really calm, and most of them, I had a probably a handful of birds. There's no way I'd stick my hand out for them because <laughs> I would come back with a stump. But I just dealt with them a little bit differently. I still did very calm, but I would use a towel on my arm. They'd get on my knee, these great big macaws that were real nervous. And I learned, I could read them. Like if they were, they were calming down, they're good at tricking you too. Um, I learned this the hard way a few times too where they'd act like they were going to step on your arm and then they'd nail you right at the last second. So those, I, I learned how to be, I think my reflexes got better. <laughs> and then I would at the very last second, get them in a towel. But even then, I mean, it's like, if your energy is good, even when they're wrapped up in a towel, they would just totally calm down. You could feel them in the towel and then you could get a better exam you wouldn't have that stress response from them. You could get, you know, most of the time I could get blood work. I could draw blood on, you know, 99.9% .9 of them without any anesthesia. And they were calm and they were fine. And, you know, the owners, I'd bring them back to the owner if they weren't in the room. And um, they asked, oh, geez, did you do anything? I'm like, well, yeah, here's the blood. <laughs> I didn't hear any squawking, you know, so. It is your energy and your calmness and your sensitivity if you just learn to read the uh, the body language of these animals. And uh, it, I think birds, I always go back to birds. That was my biggest passion. But the birds are the most sensitive, I think. And certain species like um, cockatoos and African greys are super sensitive. And it's like you you have to explain, especially the African greys, they're like little people in bird suits. <laughs> if you would explain, and not kidding you, I'm not crazy either. If you would sit there and explain to them what procedures you're going to do, it's like they like a whether and I they probably didn't understand the language. Some of them I might have, but um, it's like you just took the time with them, and then they they would be really calm and let you do whatever so yeah it's how you approach them yeah and so just thinking about um the context that, that you helped create around yourself I mean it was like fear free before fear free um right and uh but but where so many students are and some veterinarians are feeling pressured to go as fewer cell phone practices the corporations are gobbling everything up Right. And, and, and that's the main complaint is I don't have time to examine my animals, to let them de-stress and, and, and even to, to watch them, to observe them, to perform a better diagnosis and consider the treatment. It's, it's 15 minutes or fewer and, and you're done. So, um, I mean, just one of the other things that we like to promote is autonomy, which you had found, um, and, and how could you do it any other way? I think one of the things that uh, at Jillian's practice that that reminded me of was I had worked in a practice before where I had a large dog. And, you know, a lot of times when you lift a dog onto the exam table, it's terrifying for them. It's metal. It's slippery. They're in a weird position, all this stuff. And so I just sat on the floor with the dog and talked to him, pet it, and then pretty soon, you know, it's rolling on its belly and you're doing a physical exam, but the dog just thinks you're playing with it. And at that time, the owner came in and said, I don't want to see you sitting on an exam room floor again. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, it, you know, it was more about perception rather than care of the patient. And so working in Joe Lynn's clinic, 
if I was sitting on the floor with a patient, it was like, okay, <laughs> that's what the patient needed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to be lifting those big dogs. I was always on the ground with people. <laughs> And rabbits. I'm on the ground because they're scared of tables, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so kind of adapting to what the animal needs gives you the opportunity to get a more realistic exam. Yeah. And if you just tell the client that too, it's like, I know it looks more professional for me to set this up there, but they're going to be happier where they're used to being in your lab. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never even gave it a thought to explain why I'm crawling around on the floor. <laughs> I just did it. I'm like, why not? <laughs> um, and everybody would like, well, don't you want the dog up here? I'm like, or don't you want the rabbit up here? I'm like, no, they're calmer down here. If yeah. you're okay with it, I'd like to be down here. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah. and I would think liability wise, it it's better. So there's the human back issues that, that you're, I mean, some people, yeah, they, they can't get on the floor or maybe they'll have a hydraulic table, but, um, but just like with you, Lisa and picking the animal out up and then hurting yourself or getting bitten. Um, mm -hmm. and then there's the injury risk for the animal. Um, so there are those business characteristics too. And, uh, you know, I, what I see is that veterinary medicine has evolved from this more patriarchal, um, system and all the things that that engenders and expects from people to, now that it's predominantly women and not that there aren't sensitive and, and wonderful men too, but it, there, there is developing, I think this different kind of culture um, and even fear free from Marty Becker. I mean, so, so men, men are fine too with the nicer way, but there are still so many pockets. And then again, this corporate mentality of the pressure and the charge charge for a lot of stuff, refer for a lot of stuff and keep it, keep the visits short just the the thrust of this whole surviving veterinary medicine thing is is find finding your spot like you both have done and and where you can exist and and just align with your your soul and your morals or uh, whatever um but but also to p push back on these other external like just not not be swallowed up by whatever other pressures there are there so I think you both have done a great job of, of finding a, finding your places. Um, at least Nancy, do you want to jump in at all about how you survived uh, wildlife? And I did not survive, so I will not <laughs> jump in. I'm a casualty. <laughs> but we rescued you. Yes, you rescued me. <laughs> um, Okay, well, jump in anytime you want to, Nancy. Um, but, um, but Nancy, tell a different story other than the ram with the broken leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did some fun stuff. You had that moose that ate bananas. My favorite thing was when Lisa finally was available to us as wildlife officers because we were kind of a little bit like doing things in a vacuum for a while. I'm like, cause we, yeah, we went through training. We had like a day of how to tranquilize animals and euthanize animals. And then when you go out and you actually start doing it, it's like, huh, this is not exactly like how it was in school. So um, yeah, I was very thankful when Lisa was here and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all my neurotic wildlife questions because I'm an overly sensitive person working in a not overly sensitive agency sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, everything you did, it's like you worried about hurting. I mean, even if you were euthanizing a rabid or distemper <laughs> raccoon, you wanted to make sure that you did it the right way. And, um, you know, tranquilizing bears and making sure they didn't fall out of the tree and hurt themselves. And it was nice to have somebody to talk to because yeah it, it was the kind of place where you were just on your own and every time we went out and did one of these things to the animals either trap and move or trap and collar or whatever it's like we never had a like a deep I always wanted to like debrief after stuff mm -hmm. it's like okay we just caught a mountain lion in old town Fort Collins let's talk about what went right and what didn't go right and try to make it better next time and that was kind of like a like what do you want to do <laughs> Like, what are you even talking about? Let's just go on to the next thing. And I mean, I felt like here, having Lisa and Mike here and available, it's like, I think we got better 
I mean, every time there was a bear in a tree, it's like, how can we do this better? You know, how can we release them better? How can we make sure they don't come back into town better? And, you know, there was lots of ups and downs because it's like, well, shoot, that didn't work out yeah. well at all. But, I mean, I think for the most part, we we got better at what we were doing here just because we had access to somebody who was paying attention to that and was interested in the same kind of, I think Lisa and I are kind of are the same with animals. It's like, do not hurt the animals, be nice to the animals, no matter what you're doing to them. And I never want to, I mean, when I had to catch stuff, if I was taking birds into the raptor program or what, it's like, I was so sensitive about like, I'm scaring them to death. I'm hurting them more, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know. I just like the more you do it, the the more you learn how to do it correctly. I don't know. I mean, that's one of the reasons I think I was able to survive there as long as I did was because I felt like I had a kindred spirit that I could speak to <laughs> frequently. So yeah, we did lots of fun stuff. We had deer in hammocks and deer with their antlers caught in Christmas lights. And we had moose sleeping right next to I-25 on in the cornfield, in a cornfield on a weekend day. And I don't know, we caught a lot of deer and put collars on them. And we caught a lot of bears in Fort Collins with a lot of people watching us do it. And we got the two little lion kittens over by Beaver's Market on like 4th of July morning. And they did great. They had a long, happy life. I don't think it was 4th of July, but it was kind of like 4th of July weekend. And I called Lisa at like 545 in the morning. And she's like, and I said, hey, what are you doing? (laughs) She's like eating breakfast. And I'm like, oh, good. Because you want to come help me do something? And, And Lisa and Mike both came over. And I'm like, there's like two two mountain lions right here next to the grocery store and they came over and we caught them and and then they ran and we had to run I remember Mike jumping over the fence I'm like wow he's a good high jumper (laughs) we darted them and they ran in different directions and we all ran in different directions and it's like oh shoot where are they now and so Mike went over the fence. Lisa runs down the alley and I see her go head first into a lilac bush. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's strange behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and then she comes out like two seconds later, you know, chest grabbing a mountain lion and holding it. I'm like, oh, I guess she knew the lion was in the lilac bush. But Lisa had this really funny look on her face. And I'm like, oh, my God, what? And she just was like all scrunched up. And I said, what, what, what? And she's like, skunk. (laughs) (laughs) So She dove into the lilac bush, grabbed the lion and came out and then realized that the lion had been skunked. And then Lisa herself had promptly been skunked by the lion. (laughs) But we caught them at the crack of dawn and um, got them all worked up and measured and weighed and checked out their health and nobody got hurt except Lisa got skunked (laughs) and and we kept them and we released them up north and and they went on fine better than living in old town so so yeah we had some good some good times (laughs) yeah and, and I mean so that's surviving that was surviving the kittens I mean the kittens surviving and then and Lisa um but also, Nancy, you as a an extension, I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, within the veterinary, but it's anybody working with animals. I mean, it's always, we're always dealing with the emotional and physical things that it requires from us. Um, and then the sensitive and, and, you know, just trying to do the best for them because we care about them. So, so yeah, I mean, compassion and consideration and thoughtfulness and just experience and creativity. I mean, those seem to be some common themes to a successful life working with these unusual creatures. Well, and I think what Nancy said, um, debriefing after any kind of experience like that, I think is extremely important. That's how you learn from, um, oh, we did this good, so let's do that again or expand on it, or uh, we didn't do this part good. And I mean, we did that all the time in in the hospital too. Mm -hmm. And and I think it helps 
you know, so much you hear about the compassion fatigue now mm-hmm. and the suicide rate and everything in the veterinary field. And I think if um, there was a lot more debriefing and a lot more yeah. um, just owning your own feelings, but being able to express that and being able to diffuse it, I think would be important. But like Nancy had said, you know, to have other people to talk to and, and other resources and not to feel so alone. Because yeah. uh, I, I know I hear that from people too, either they get hired, whether it's a private or a corporate practice, and and maybe they're early in their career, or maybe they're not, but it's like, who can I talk to? Who can help me with this? And then whatever the repercussions are, and that client goes on or whatever happens with a wild animal or whatever, but you, you, it's stuck in your brain and your heart and your soul and all that. And for, for years, I mean, like you guys have all these memories and, and how do we, how do we come out of this life, you know, good with ourselves and good with our choices. And that's moment by moment, I think getting in the, getting around good people, you know, like yourselves that are, that we're all pulling in the same direction. The, in the wildlife uh, veterinarians, the ones that work for the state agencies that have the type of position I did, have a very close network. And that was the only way to survive because you're always working on the edge. You're always working in a situation that you haven't necessarily been in, but somebody else might have. Um, and so it was so valuable to be able to get on the phone and say, I've got a moose that I'm working with in this weird situation. How am I going to cope with it? Or, and just having people that immediately could sympathize or help you out or, you know, kind of debrief with you or it was huge. And so it, it was a very close network of people that um, sometimes my technicians would say, you know, how many calls a day do you take from other agencies? And I'm like, about the same number I call them, you know, because oh, yeah. it was very much two way. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and I think a lot of this is, um, it's just a gift to be able to do this. I know that when I first started working in the wildlife rehab, I mean, that was my main experience um, with veterinary medicine because when I was sixteen and tried to volunteer in a regular practice, and I saw, you know, a healthy cat being euthanized because at one year old because the woman liked to have kittens every year. So it's like, there is no way ever, 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 I will never be a veterinarian. Sorry. I, I like, it sounds good, but I can't do it. And so I, you know, I, I found my way indirectly to it and, and realized that I have to have a pretty um, solid bubble around me. Like there's not much I can do outside of my bubble because it's too upsetting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but when, when I did start working, doing the acupuncture on the wildlife at the green, eventually Greenwood Wildlife Rehab in Boulder, uh, it just made me so high to be able to work with them and to do what I had been doing for humans and, and under the supervision of veterinarians, but because um, I wasn't a vet yet. But it's just like, this is, this is a really special opportunity. Um, and I just find wild animals so incredible um that it it it's to just be able to to encounter them um you know in your work but also in in a place that is conscientious i mean so so it's it's like i would need those two things but sounds like you all eventually more or less found found that i think like you said also learning to respect your bubble and not feeling like you have to perform outside of it there's somebody else that can perform outside of it and you can perform well inside of it um i kind of, i had this conversation recently with another veterinary friend of mine that's a clinician at csu and i was in a situation it was with, with a uh, talking to a human <laughs> and i was so flustered and couldn't and couldn't get the communication going and later she said you know you can face a lion and get less flustered than you did with that person and I'm like but for me that's part of my bubble I mean I know how to read their behavior and they're predictable and I know how to you know kind of contain my energy I have no idea how to deal with a crazy person you know and so 
and she does. And so I could just kind of step back behind her and say, you know what, you know how to deal with this. I don't. Uh, and it's hard for us as humans to reach a point of ever feeling like it's okay to do what you do well in your bubble and not feeling like you have to step out of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, aside from rabies and distemper, I don't know of too many animals that intrinsically without human, you know, impact go crazy like people do. Like, you know, he, I don't know, humans, it, it is so different understanding humans who have all this history and I don't know, just, so a lion is, is more honest and direct versus yeah. a human has all kinds of masks they can wear and agendas and everything like that. So, so I think that's probably another characteristic maybe of when, when wild animals, like, I mean, this, this is. This is probably sounds a little woo woo from my Boulder days, but that's where I started working with. But I still believe it. It's like when I see like the eyes of a wild animal. If if I was to say where God is or anything <laughs> like that, that's where I see it most closely is in their eyes. It's so, you know, pure and unpolluted. Just in nature, in general. Yeah. It's that's where you have to get back to your roots, being out in nature. I mean, I I did a lot of um, uh, rehabilitation as well and you know i would do surgical repair on some of these um raptors um and they'd come in all mangled usually because of human causes and then um boy the moment you open that carrier and you see them fly free again is just you know it's a feeling you just cannot describe it's pretty incredible and I think that's what carries you through the negative parts. <laughs> you got to find those things in in vet medicine. There's always going to be negative stuff, but you've got to find those those little moments that that are going to carry you through. Right. I, I think you have to find a way to decompress from the negative things. Like Jill Landon and I go on these long trail rides and just yep. decompress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, on horses. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that the jostling of the horse, that just kind of loosens you up too. <laughs> and then you're with the animal. Yeah. That's great. Well, and the horses are honest too. And uh, they will mirror your energy. <laughs> you, you, if you are if you bring the stress of, of work onto that horse, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> They're going to say, no, try again. <laughs> right, right. That's so, that's so cool. Yeah. And so, so Joe Lynn, you, you live like on a farm now or where did, you moved out? About 40 acres. Um, we call it our little mini ranch. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we moved from Northern Colorado and we decided it's getting way too crowded up here. Um, I think we moved about as far away as we can get. We're right on the edge of a Canyon and we might see one person drive by every few days. <laughs> And, it's <laughs> yeah um right and i think another um outlet you have is your you do sculpture yes i started that just before i retired one of my wonderful clients um diane mason is quite a sculpturist herself and was kind enough to uh take me under her wing and put up with all my phone calls now we have to do it long distance because she's still up in loveland and um yeah, I didn't know I had it in me, but it's pretty fun. <laughs> She's pretty awesome. It's oh, yeah. I mean, it's like you're a professional sculptress artist. Uh, not professional yet, but I'm <laughs> pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, your stuff looks amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Of course, it's animals, you know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's the types of animals you worked with. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's, uh, that's fun because it's like I worked with these animals for 30 years. And so when you're actually forming them into clay, it's like, well, that doesn't look right. What is it? You know, I've only looked at a million of these guys. So right. <laughs> and, it, and you just focus on that. Now all your worries and problems of the world goes away. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, um, any last words to, to wrap things up? I mean, I think we kind of covered the, 
the scope of your career? And then Lisa, what are you doing now? Did you, did you end your career? Or? I retired and now I occasionally go and help a biologist or researcher and I can pick and choose what projects and when I want to do it. And I have my horses and um, what I wanted, among other things, to retire. Well, I, the, the job was very physically demanding as well as emotionally demanding. And I wanted to retire while I still had some mental capacity as well as physical capacity to go do other things. So, um, yeah. I I stay remarkably busy. I can't always tell you what it is I've been doing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing when you retire. I'm packed with. (laughs) And I think what I'm doing is I'm giving more time to myself now. You know, I walk out on my canyon every day and just sit and just watch the birds. And, and it's amazing how healing that is from anything you need healed from. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's Yeah. I think one of the biggest things for me is I can sit and have a cup of coffee. Right. I mean, <laughs> Who did that? Know, and I, can yeah. read, I can read books. I've read probably 20 books in the last couple months. I hadn't read that many books in the last 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Right. Other than textbooks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So just to kind of wrap up, so Joe, we'll start with you. Is, is there anything you would have done differently or in retrospect, are you, are you cool with every, you know, did it seem to fall into place in retrospect? Everything fell into place. It was like um, when I needed a different path, it came through. And I mean, I discovered acupuncture and laser through you, which has been, I mean, that first, I'll never forget the first, um, class I took with you the whole time I'm saying oh my god this is magic this is magic and you know I just uh just bringing every little thing in that I and when you start looking down that hole Mm -hmm. it brings all kinds of other things that are related so no I think um I like the path I went on but I'm glad I retired early too because like Lisa said I want to I want to be able to enjoy um and have fun and play because I I wasn't very good at um, work balance. That probably was one thing I probably would have changed. Is um, and I think people nowadays may be a little bit more aware of that. But you know, my generation, it was all about working and getting the job done. I mean, I would bring animals into my bathroom. <laughs> I would be up all night trying to save them, and. Um, yeah, I guess if I'd learned a little bit more work balance, that probably would have been a little bit easier on me and my family, but we survived. It's all good. Yeah, we had fun. Yeah. It's a tough call. Yeah. Yeah. And and Lisa, how about you? In retrospect? I, I would have to say the same thing that uh, the career path I went on worked out for me. Um, the work-life balance was not there. I mean, it, it takes a toll on you when you're trying to you know, do your job well and be a parent and be a spouse. And, you know, uh, my, as my father was aging, trying to keep up with his needs and all of these things, you, you know, that's one of the things they don't tell you in the real bit, that you're not only going to have to take care of your kids, you're going to have to take care of your parents. <laughs> right. And so oh, work-life balance is really challenging. And I think one of the things that, I both children and I are fortunate to have really supportive husbands, but a lot of times, you know, that gender role, you tend to be the nurturing person. So you're doing most of the caretaking. Um, but fortunately we've had spouses that also helped out, but I can't imagine if you were trying to do it all anyway. Yeah. That, I think work-life balance is one of the more challenging things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I can imagine like for, when so Jolyn, when would you have ever said, "Well, you little bird, you're. I know you need me all night to live, but I have to go home now and play tennis or something." I mean, how, like in the moment when, or and you too, Lisa. Like if Nancy called and there's kittens, oh my god, in Old Town. But um, you know, so when you go running and you go help yeah, them, <laughs> right, right, right. So. Just what, what could you, when could you have said no at which time, unless just the whole structure was, I don't, it, 
it's hard to know yeah in the moment what how, how and i think too for both of us at least our kids were interested enough and participated you know like my kids have been out with us any number of times when we're doing capture work or sitting in the bathroom with me <laughs> trying to get the patient to survive the night whatever um so at least and i don't i think they enjoyed participating but that's always a challenge too yeah i do remember that lisa brought her daughter with her when we caught the lions and she had her riding clothes on because you guys were supposed to be headed to a riding lesson and instead you came in riding clothes to capture mountain lions <laughs> yeah yeah but it was fun yeah i th- i don't know how old my daughter was when she first learned how to set a catheter and some things like that but she was pretty skilled <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, great so we we could just close now but but it's just I mean, and who knows what happens after we die? And and sometimes you hear a story that that you meet those that you encountered along the way. I mean, we don't know, but but I do think about um, just everybody that we've engaged with of, of whatever species, and and seeing them on the other side, and you know, letting them say thank you. Yeah. I, whenever I would, oh, now I'm gonna get choked up. Whenever I would have to put a patient down, my mother died fairly early. And so when I would have to euthanize a patient because, you know, it was a not a trip, I would always say, tell mom hi when you see her. And that was one of the things that clients were always like, and I'm like, no, my mom will be excited to see another dog out there, you know. Um, but yeah, so hopefully some of them we do get to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, you hear stories, you know, when people come back, near-death experiences that, they did yeah. engage with others. I think so. they are. What's that? Yeah, I think they are going to be up there waiting for us. Yeah. 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 Whole school of them. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and hopefully they'll play nicely together since there's going to be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mice, rats, and lizards, and everything. Well, thank you for doing this, everybody. Um, well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, was an interesting experience. Yeah. 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 Is Nancy Everything there? we do is an interesting experience. <laughs> okay, we're done recording now. But Lisa's the most interesting, smart, compassionate, helpful, kind person. And so humble about, she's so incredibly humble about, she is like the coolest, bravest person I've ever met in my life. It's true. She shows up over here at the Moose laying next to I-25. And she said, what do you want me to do? And I said, Start it and drop it right there. I do not want it to step one foot onto I-25. And little Lisa gets her dart gun out and she like army crawls out through the corn. And Shane and I were like up on top of our trucks. And Shane protected Lisa so much. He's always like, you have to protect Lisa. Don't lose Lisa. No matter what, don't lose Lisa. And he and I were up on the truck slashing and it's like, where did she go? I was like, I don't know. She's in the corn. And all of a sudden the corn's moving like right next to the moose. It's like, oh, she's going to hand inject him. (laughs) (laughs) And she belly crawled up to this moose and darted it and did exactly what I asked. I'm like, that thing cannot be staggering on I-25 on Saturday morning. (laughs) Bam, down. (laughs) And then, so yeah, she totally just like randomly on a weekend morning came and did that out of the blue it's like i'm not brave enough or smart enough but then we had to carry it out of the cornfield and then <laughs> and then who carries it lisa lisa <laughs> carries the freaking moose oh, no. Nancy. It, it, yeah there were a whole bunch of us trying to carry it through the corn stubble and it was corn <laughs> yeah you know, like lisa, she needs to write a book <laughs> oh yeah i can help with the stories <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think you should all write books. And um, and if you don't, let's just record it. Record the stories here. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> that story should be in, Nancy. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it was one of those. It's like, what am I going to do? I am not skilled enough. I am not anywhere near brave enough to deal with this. So it's like, oh, let's just call Lisa. <laughs> He'll solve all my Saturday morning issues. 
acupuncture, uh, was it Rascal or something, Lisa, one of the mountain lands? Yeah. In laser. Uh, yeah, we did acupuncture, laser, and massage, um, and Nancy videoed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, and then you and I uh, acupunctured that uh, lamb. Yeah. That was in the little wheelchair thing. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. uh, uh, deer that evolved his Achilles, um, he was very responsive to that. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. More fun awaits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to learn integrative medicine from a scientific perspective, visit us at curacore.org. Thanks for listening to another installment of Surviving Veterinary Medicine.